The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. And I invite you to turn again to Luke chapter 22. In his classic work, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan draws it to a close with a quite staggering statement. He says, And then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the gate of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. I saw that there was a way to hell from the very gate of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. The Bible makes clear what human experience confirms, namely that some professing Christians may not persevere in their profession of Christ to the end of their lives. That some who profess to follow Jesus will not continue to the end and will not be saved. Now, the central character in the verses that are before us this morning provides us with the classic example and most chilling illustration of this fact. Judas Iscariot lives on the stage of Scripture as a constant reminder to us, as an awful warning to each of us who may be prepared at any point on the journey to contend ourselves with the fact that somehow or another we're caught up in the routine, that we are included in the crowd, that we have customarily thought of ourselves as belonging, despite the fact that our behaving gives no evidence of belonging. When we have heard the voice of God speak into our lives and we've known that it has spoken to us and we ought to repent and acknowledge that our lives are a sham, we have continued to hide behind the fact of our involvement in the crowd. And every time we turn and look into the face of this tragic character, we realize that he is there in part to remind us that outward conformity to the routine of Christianity that is not matched by a relationship that speaks to inward reality uh, will yield us nothing on the day of his returning. Now, chapter 22 takes us into the final section. Indeed, we have 180 verses to go to the end of Luke's gospel. However long that will take us is not the issue. But death for Jesus is just around the corner. The celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Passover, have drawn large crowds to Jerusalem. It was an annual event, and the people came from far and wide, some who got there early, taking up residence in the city itself, and others, like Jesus and his disciples, having to live in the outlying areas, in their case, on the Mount of Olives. The theme of the celebrations was, of course, national liberation. The people were looking back to the day when they had been set free from the tyranny and bondage uh, that their forefathers had known in Egypt. And so it was customary for the sort of nationalistic fervor to rise in the crowd, and there always seemed to be the buzz, the potential for civil disruption. And the authorities, as we see from these verses and from elsewhere, were concerned not simply uh, to make sure that uh, things did not get out of control, but they were primarily concerned to find a way, actually, to get rid of Jesus himself. And you can see that there in the second verse. This, of course, had been their preoccupation for some time. If you go back a couple of pages to chapter 19 and verse 47... Luke has given us a summary statement there of the events as they were unfolding. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Their chief concern then was to get rid of Jesus without creating total chaos, without them uh, becoming a catalyst for insurrection. 
Mark uses uh, an interesting little word. You'll find it in Mark 14. It's, he says that they were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But they were careful to say to one another, don't let's do it during the feast or the people may riot. So they had a dilemma. They had a problem. They knew that they needed to be done with this Galilean carpenter, this Christ, this miracle worker, this preacher. He was attracting so much attention. There were so many people in the Jerusalem community who had reason to be thankful for his life and ministry. There were blind people who could now see and lame who could walk, and people whose lives had been in shatters and in tatters who had been caught up by the power of this Lord Jesus, and they were manifestly prepared to let the whole world know that they loved him and that they wanted to follow him. Of course, these religious leaders were really disgusted with this. They wanted people to like their sermons too, and people were just falling asleep in their sermons. Much of the stuff that they were banging out at the synagogue was dull, dry, and patently ineffective. And for more reasons than they were prepared to acknowledge, they wanted to find some way to get rid of this Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they could hardly have imagined in their wildest dreams that the way out of their dilemma would come as a result of the initiative of one of this Lord Jesus Christ's inner circle. And perhaps when they were huddled in their uh, little committees trying to work out a strategy that they could unleash at the precise moment in time, perhaps during one of those get-togethers, uh, one of them came from the outer courtyard to say that they had a visitor, and the visitor was none other than one of the twelve disciples of Jesus. Somebody probably said, well, which one is it? Do we know him? He said, well, it's not one of the main three, that's for sure. I think his name is Judas. I believe he's Judas Iscariot, the Judean from Kerioth. Well, what does he want? Well, apparently he's volunteering to help us. To help us in what way? Well, he says that he can deliver Jesus up to us. He knows where he goes. He knows his haunts. And he is able to do this under cover of darkness. And apparently, although we've been thinking that we need to wait until the feasts are over, maybe there is a way for us to intervene right now. The good news is that this Judas is willing to help. The bad news is, is that it's going to cost us. Well, how much? Well, the figure has apparently somewhere around 30 pieces. Oh, that's nothing. That is nothing to pay for such a conquest as this. Now, all of that is kind of wrapped up in the opening phrase of verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot. Notice, one of the twelve. The little phrase, one of the twelve, is in there just to do what it does to us, to make the hair stand up on the back of our necks. This is not somebody picked off the street, as it were, who suddenly spills the beans on the inner circle. No, this is somebody in the inner circle who steps out from the group and presents themselves. And Satan and his activity is at the very heart of all that is now unfolding. Incidentally, you may remember that back in Luke chapter 4 and in verse 13, after the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, Luke records that Satan left him waiting for a more opportune time. And it was just left hanging for us. And the activity of Satan has not been absent, but there has been the notion for each who remember the phrase that somewhere along the line, all the powers of hell are going to be unleashed against this Christ and his followers. And here it would seem to be that opportune time. Now, what does it mean that Satan entered Judas? We dare not minimize this in any way. Judas has somehow or another surrendered to the power of Satan. He has allowed himself to come completely under the influence of the evil one. Some of the literature that came out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran community, speaks to a worldview that identifies just what is taking place here. I quote from it. In the hand of the angel of darkness, 
is total dominion over the sons of deceit. They walk on paths of darkness. Due to the angel of darkness, all the sons of justice stray, and all their sins, their iniquities, their failings, and their mutinous deeds are under his dominion. Now, this speaks to what unfolds in the New Testament, doesn't it? When Paul writes to the Ephesians, reminding them of the nature of the struggle they face, he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And while this struggle here is not ultimately human, because there is a cosmic dimension to what is taking place, while it is not ultimately human, it is definitely human. Now, I say that because the two extremes, anytime you're dealing with the devil, are always there, either to make more of his activity than we should or to make less of it than we ought. If we seek to minimize the activity of Satan, then we deny the truth of the Bible. If we seek to make more of the activity of Satan, then we may make Judas less than human. We may provide, as it were, in our minds, uh, Judas with an out. So when you read this phrase, then Satan entered Judas, how do you read it? If you envision Judas as somehow being involuntarily possessed, then you're on the wrong track altogether. Don't read this phrase, then Satan entered Judas, as if somehow or another it was an invasion. Read it as an invitation that the reason that Satan was able to do as he did in the life of Judas was because his dastardly desires coalesced with the spirit of Judas himself. There is no hint here of Judas being unable to control his own actions. Rather, what we have here is essentially Judas opening the door of his life, as it were, to Satan. You may remember that back in Genesis 4, in the story of Cain and Abel, you have this amazing little picture where God comes and he speaks uh, to the brother and he says to him, you know, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, and you must master it. Let me say to you in passing that it is the ultimate in spiritual naivety to live a minute of my life absent the awareness that sin crouches at my door, desires to have me, and the call given to me is to master it, not in my own strength, but by the enabling of the Spirit of God. But notice, it is not something that God does in spite of us or something that God does in a vacuum. We are volitionally involved in saying yes to Christ, in saying no to Satan. I'm thankful that in my childhood I learned these lessons in simplistic ways with little ditties, taught from my infancy to sing. For example, I met Jesus at the crossroads where the two ways meet. And Satan, too, was standing there. And he said, come this way. Lots of lots of pleasures I will give to you today. And then the Sunday school teacher, there were always actions with these things. And we, and we had to sing. But I said no. <laughs> and I'm in my 50s. I sing the chorus in my car. I meet the crossroads every single day I live my life. Don't get up on your high horse and say, whoa, and Satan entered Judas. What a weird, esoteric experience this must be. No, 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 no. And Judas opened the door. He didn't resist him. Therefore, Satan did not flee from him. Jesus had to suffer. 
But Judas did not have to be the traitor. Jesus had to suffer. But Judas did not have to be the traitor. Some of us read our Bibles as if we were Islamic, as if we were fatalists, as if we were, as if we were determinists. That somehow or another Judas, some poor unsuspecting soul was picked up and programmed for this. No, this is Judas. Oh, yes, according to the set and foreknowledge of God, but the foreknowledge of God does not mean the foreordination of God, for those of you who are able to think in those terms. And so Phillips, in trying to help us understand the nature of this great statement, paraphrases it, then a diabolical plan came into the mind of Jesus, Diabolus, the devil. Then a diabolical plan came into the mind of Satan came into the mind of Judas. Notice the verbs, the doing words, as we would say to our children. There's no sense here of Judas somehow or another in a dwam moving around as empowered by some outside and alien force. No, verse 4, Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard. He said to himself, I'm going to go and talk to those fellows. Judas went, and Judas discussed They entered into a discussion about what was going to take place, why it would take place, what the rewards would be of having it take place. Verse 6, Judas consented. This is all volitional. You will notice this. And Judas watched then for an opportunity. Keep in mind that this is akin to what James teaches us concerning the nature of temptation. When he warns against temptation, he says in James chapter 1, make sure that you realize that God can't be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So how does it happen then? Well, he says, each one, verse 14 of James 1, each one, including Judas, including you, including me, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, his own evil desire, every sin is an inside job. Every sin starts in your mind. Hence, our thinking is so crucial. And the things that we dwell upon, the things that we allow to fill our minds, the kind of worldview concepts, the the notions of truth and error, of righteousness and purity, all of those things do not exist, as it were, in some file that we're able to click on and click off in the way that we might move through computer technology. No, this impregnates the totality of who I am. And every sin then, is an inside job when by my own evil desire I'm dragged away and I'm enticed. Think of it in fishing terms, if you like. The fish's mother says to the fish, now look, there'll be a lot of very attractive things out there when you go swimming away this afternoon, but be careful that you don't allow your eyes to be bigger than your stomach and do not allow yourself to be dragged away and and enticed Because if desire conceives, it will give birth to sin and foolishness. And sin, when it is full grown, will give birth to death. And they'll hook you right out of the water and tear it off your face and beat you on the head. And it will all be over. You see, the questions to ask here are not, how could this happen? I understand how it can happen. I'm interested in why it happened and when it happened, but I I, I don't have a problem really with how it can happen. And the person who ought to be most alarmed is the person who sits there saying, well, it can never happen to me. Because what we have, apart from the dilemma that these leaders face, is the enigma of Judas himself. He's a puzzle, isn't he? Why Judas? Why did Judas do this? That's what I've been thinking about all week. Every time my mind went into neutral, I began to think, why did Judas do this? And I can't answer with any certainty at all. Because there's no categorical statement that explains why, but there are inferential statements from which we can make deductions, but our deductions must always be subservient to the clear instruction of the Bible. 
we know that it definitely had something to do with money, right? Because money is involved in the discussion at every point. Money was clearly an issue for this character. You can read of this in each of the gospel accounts and in the gospel record in Matthew, it says that uh, they entered into a dialogue about how much cash ought to be involved in the transaction. John tells us that on the occasion when the lady brought the alabaster jar of very expensive perfume and broke it, that Judas' indignation on that day, although it was a protestation that he said was directly related to the fact that the money had been wasted when it could have been given to the poor, John editorializes in John chapter 12, at verse 4 and following, and he says that had nothing at all to do with it because Judas, who was the treasurer of the twelve, pilfered regularly from the bag. He was regularly into the funds. And somehow or another, money was involved in a way that it shouldn't have been. I wonder, for example, when Jesus told the story of the parable of the shrewd manager in Luke 16, you remember where he, the master commends the dishonest manager because he acts shrewdly. He came up with a clever way of dealing with the eventuality. And Jesus then went on to say, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal dwellings. And I can see Judas standing on the side going, this is it. Now we're going. Jesus, that's the kind of thing I've been saying. Get the money going. And then his eyes narrowing as Jesus continues. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, Judas would be looking, feeling the eyes of Jesus burn into his soul, hoping that none of his friends know, although John for sure knows what's going on, who will entrust you with riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and hate the other. And then the punchline, you cannot serve God and money. Now that must have run right up the back of Judas. Because that's exactly what he was trying to do. He was trying to be the follower of Christ. And at the same time, he had some kind of agenda that was related to his desire for cash. He was influenced by Satan, but he was also influenced by money. And indeed, apparently the influence of money and the influence of Satan were interwoven here in this unfolding scenario. You remember Paul says to Timothy, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I wonder, did he have Judas in mind? He doesn't say some people who had money, some people who used their money, as if somehow or another the existence of money in itself was an evil. No, he says people who were eager for money, the kind of eagerness that this guy had explained. I want to go in that bag and take some for myself. I say that it's for the poor, but I don't really care about the poor. I'm going to go on TV and tell people that if they give this, we'll give a buck fifty to the poor, but I'm going to make four fifty for myself. I'm going to tell them that if they sign up for the $27 package, we will do this, but I know that I can make 15 bucks out of every 27 multiplied by however many people phone up, and I know the demographics are such that by and so on. Boy, are you alarmed by this? Are you concerned by this at all? I am. Remember, Paul says, we are not those who peddle the word of God for profit. We're not going to use the Bible and the teaching of the Bible as a mechanism to line our own nests. And no one faces that challenge more than those of us who are entrusted with the privilege of having our life set apart for the preaching and teaching of the Word and who are supported out of the hearts of the people of God in order that we might enjoy that privilege. Now, 
Many a covetous heart has been uncovered in the manse and in the home of the pastor. Thursday evening when I spoke to a large radio rally in Dallas, some 2,000 or more people there, one of the questions that they had asked my assistant before I went was, hey, will, what, what, will, what product will he bring? It's a very contemporary American question. They always have a table for you when you go to preach anywhere. We have a table for you. What do you want me to do? Lie on the table? Eat at the table? What am I supposed What am I Well, they say we have your table. Now, I don't mean to criticize what anyone else is doing. I just know the perversity of my own heart. I said, no, there will be no books. I mean, if you want books, go to a bookstore, but don't expect me to show up in town with a bunch of books. Why? Because I make money off books. And 2,000 people that are predisposed to me that don't really know much about me, that think I'm nicer than I really am, I can sell a lot of books. And 1,000 books at 10 bucks a book is a nice Thursday. You can't serve God and money. And I can't trust my heart. For if I show up with the Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations strategy, as opposed to the gospel strategy, I don't even know in the perversity of my own heart why I'm going. I can't determine whether I'm going to put profit to the bottom line or whether I'm going to preach the gospel. And the fact that I even mention it to you scares me as well because the challenge comes again and again and again. And it comes to you too. You see, your checkbook and my checkbook probably say more about the nature of our Christian devotion than the strength of our singing or the vehemence of our protestations or the dramatic use of our time in whatever area of service we have. And when we think of Satan entering into Judas, sidling up to him, sneaking in, grabbing a hold, whatever else we say, it is impossible to conclude that this took place absent the issue of money. But was it just money? No, clearly not. Because anybody that was really in it for the money is not going to settle for 30 pieces of silver. Come on, the market can stand much more. Come on, Judas, if you're really in it for the cash, get a good return. Don't sell yourself short for 30 pieces of silver. Ah, but you see, a covetous heart doesn't just involve money. A covetous heart involves jealousy. Jealousy. I think, I think Satan, I think Judas was jealous. He was always called Judas Iscariot. His name was always last on the list. Every time they go through the list, it always comes out. Judas Iscariot is last. That could wear on you after a while, couldn't it? And why do they always have to call him Judas Iscariot? Well, to distinguish him from the other Judas. Yes, I understand. But why Iscariot? Why does it have to say Judas the man from Kerioth? I mean, because he is the man from Kerioth. He is a man from a Judean village. And he is the only Judean. And the other 11, no, they're not Judeans. And somehow that kind of thing, like you're in it, but you're not of it. You're an alien. That can start to wear on your mind. You know, you don't really belong here. What are you doing singing America the Beautiful? That's none of your business. Can't you just hear him if you wandered with him in the crowd, muttering to himself, why didn't I get to go to the transfiguration? I don't know what the deal is with Peter, James, and John all the time. Peter, James, John. James, Peter, John. Peter, James, John. Where is Judas in the deal? Why don't I get a chance at any of these things? You see, the heart that grace has renewed will banish that and it's, and it, as it crouches at the door and desires to get you. Well, I'm not getting the, the, the profile that I deserve. I'm not being uh, matched up in relationship to my gifts. I'm not having the opportunities that other people have said I deserve and so on and so on. Listen, the miracle is this great miracle that any of us are on the team at all. It is whether they give you the number one jersey, the number 12 jersey, or the number 780 jersey. I don't know how they give those numbers out in baseball, but I have a sneaking suspicion if you get, you know, if you attend the practice and the guy says, take number 384, the chances are that you're not going to be starting anytime soon. 
You're going to be throwing a lot of balls against the wall, maybe for the rest of your life. But I'll tell you what, just to wear that jersey. I don't care what the number is. Give me that jersey. Because I don't deserve to play in any case. See, the guy who says, hey, I need the early jersey, the one through ten, please. This is me. No, when grace refines a heart, it banishes that kind of covetous jealousy. I think also that it probably had something to do with the fact that this individual knew a little about anxiety. He could see the writing on the wall. He said to himself, this road show is going to come to a crashing halt here any time. And when it does, when it all hits the wall, it's not just Jesus that's going to get it. We're all going to get it. You just see him sitting at the side of the road, biting his fingernails down to a stump, going in the bag and counting the money again. One for you, two for me. One for you, two for me. No, I don't know. I think we ought to get out of here. This thing is, this thing is over. I know what I'll do. I'll turn King's evidence. Why don't I slip off, get ahead of the game, mention the fact that I can hand him over. He'll go down with the rest. I'll be in the clear. They'll look favorably on me. After all, isn't that what Jesus was saying? Make friends. See how perversely you can fiddle with the scriptures? Or was it some kind of urgent desire to see the kingdom of God come? This is what some people suggest. I've read this, and some, uh, and some have spoken to me of it. It's a famous explanation, and it goes along these lines. That Judas was impatient with Jesus. He was impatient with him because apparently Jesus was missing opportunities to establish his kingdom. Judas was driven by a genuine desire to see it all happen. And since it wasn't happening as quickly as he would like, the sense of urgency that was within him caused him to determine to precipitate a crisis which would involve Jesus in displaying his, plow, his, his power, in declaring his glory, in establishing his kingdom. Now, this is actually a clever attempt to exonerate Judas. The fact of the matter is there's nothing in the New Testament to support the idea. And indeed, everything points against it because it leaves us with a Jesus who, rather than moving inexorably towards the cross, as the gospel writers tell us he was doing, we find him like a kind of dithering, procrastinating Lord Hamlet. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge, you know. Witness you this army with such mass and charge that is prepared to go and do this, but I haven't got the courage to do that. What shall I do? I don't know what to do, and so on. Is that how it happened? And were it not for the fact that Judas showed up and precipitated a crisis, Jesus would have gone on like this, as it were, forever? No, not for a moment. Not for a moment. You see, when you assume that, then in place of Judas the traitor, you have Judas the misguided saint. Instead of treachery, you have an error in judgment. And I think we can say with safety that Jesus would certainly have been willing to pardon exuberance mixed with error. But instead, he pronounces judgment. Woe to that man by whom the betrayal comes. I think the only way we can finally rest our case is to recognize that what we see in Jesus, what we see in Judas, pardon me, is, if you like, the epitome, the infamy of the rebellion of man against the dominion of God, that he, is, he embodies, if you like, the spirit of the Antichrist that you see Judas, if you could look into his heart, I'm sure in his mind he's thinking along these lines. I thought this was going to be much more successful. I thought this was going to be much more profitable. I've been sold a bill of goods here, false hopes, empty promises. This has been a complete waste of my time. Incidentally, 
If that's how you feel because somebody told you that if you put up your hand or walked an aisle, you would have security and hope and peace and all these things, and you said to yourself, I don't have any of it. The reason you don't have it is because Jesus never promised it, and the gospel that was preached to you was a false gospel, and to believe a false gospel is to believe no gospel, and therefore it is to remain unconverted. Hence your dilemma. Judas says to himself, I detest the 11 for their brainless devotion. I detest the way I'm able to fool with them and fiddle with the stuff. I've been embarrassed by Jesus on multiple occasions, never more so than when we came around the corner and looked out on the scene of Jerusalem, and instead of us mounting large chargers and going in to triumph with the kingdom, he, Jesus knelt down on the ground and began to weep. And Judas says, what kind of leadership is that? And all the time, his thoughts were fueled with bitterness and spite and revenge, knowing that Jesus could read him like a book. His heart, his mind, his strength, his soul set in a different direction, and all that remained was the deed. Listen, when my heart, mind, soul, and strength is set in an anti-God dimension direction. When my thoughts are pursuing my own jealous instincts, my own covetous heart, my desire to line my own nest, the anxiety about my own well-being, an urgency to see things happen the way I desire for them to happen. We, we, it, you are, I am a slow train coming for disaster. A slow train en route to disaster. Now, all of that to conclude in this way. When, when did this start for Judas? When? After all, he'd left all to follow Christ, hadn't he? He'd responded to the appeal of Jesus the way that everyone else had done. Jesus said, I want you to follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. And he said, fine, I sign up for that. I'd like to be in that the way that many of us have done. Somebody preached the gospel to us. They told us you're supposed to do something, and we figured we would do it. Some of us actually thought that by the doing of it, we would be converted, not realizing that unless we were converted, there was no value in doing it. Otherwise, of course, we would convert ourselves, wouldn't we? When since it is God who converts... And he'd lived under Jesus' influence. He'd seen Jesus' compassion. He'd watched Jesus heal. He'd listened to the entreaties of Jesus. He'd heard Jesus say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Judas had said to himself, I ought to come, you know. I ought to come. He's speaking to me. I don't want any of my colleagues to know, but he's speaking to me because I'm weary and I'm heavy laden. I'm burdened down with this sack of money. Not because it's so heavy. It's not that heavy. There isn't much in it. But I'm burdened by what it represents. And he's giving such a lovely entreaty. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. And, and learn of me. I'm lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. And Judas said, oh, rest for my soul. What would I give for rest for my soul? And he said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want anyone to know. I mean, if I step forward and say, Jesus, I accept your entreaty, then what will my friends say? Because they assume. I mean, I can't be part of the pastoral team and get converted, can I? I can't be part of the leadership structure in our organization and step forward and recognize that I'm the unconverted one. Loved one, if you are, step forward. Your eternal destiny hangs in it. Don't allow the routine of church to give you any false security at all. Don't rest in the fact that you ever did anything at all as if it wasn't your doing of things that saved you. Hmm. Judas said to himself, Oh, Jesus must have thought I had potential. Jesus must have thought I had promise. He did. But the clouds came in. The disappointments arrived. 
the frustrations, the bitterness. Slowly, surely, inescapably, it began to dawn on Judas. that he never really was Christ's man. He never really was Christ's. You see, he fell from his position in the band, but he didn't fall from Christ. He was lost because he was never saved. You remember that song, Judy Collins, there's a moons and dunes and Ferris wheels, the dizzy dancing way it feels when every fairy tale comes real. I've looked at life that way, you know. But now it's just a passing show and you leave them laughing when you go. And if you care, don't let them know. Don't give yourself away. And, and it goes into love, you know. Da, 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 I'm feeling proud. To, to say I love you right out loud. And then, and then the refrain. I really don't know love at all. See, that's where Judas got. I've done the moons and the dunes and the Ferris wheels. I've done the dizzy dancing stuff. Everybody thinks that I'm there, but I'm not. You see, and in that moment, the one who puts his hand in the dish with me now, don't put your hand in, Judas. You don't have to. But he did. And God confirmed his decision. When you think of what John is writing in 1 John about those who have gone out from us, he says they went out from us because they were not of us, because if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. Surely he had to have Judas in his mind as the archetypal picture of the same. The story of Judas is a chilling, powerful, permanent warning to every member of the visible church about the dreadful possibility that among us who apparently live in the closest connection with Jesus, there may be those who are inwardly false those who, although their colleagues do not know, are busily engaged in betrayal. Do you remember the memo circulated years ago from Jordan Management Consultants to Jesus? I've had it in my file for years, 20 years or more. It went like this, and with this I finish. I think it makes the point of how easy it is for us to get it completely wrong. Dear sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you've picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests. We have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews with each of them, with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. It is the staff's opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background educational, education and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you're undertaking. They do not have the team concept. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, placed personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a skeptical attitude that would tend to undermine morale. Matthew has been blacklisted by the Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of your candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your CEO and right-hand man. And Satan entered Judas, not as a result of an unsought invasion, but as a result of a personal invitation. 
Father, the writer to the Hebrews reminds us that your word is like a CAT scan. It runs from the tip of our toes all the way through up to our heads and takes these three-dimensional pictures that are unescapable in the information they provide. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And lead me in the way everlasting. And may the grace and mercy and peace that comes from God the Father whose love is greater than our hearts even when they condemn us. Rest upon and remain with each one today and forevermore. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.